Well, greetings, church family. Today's daily Bible reading had us in Leviticus at chapters 23 and 24. Now, chapter 23, verses 1 and 2 sets up the rest of the chapter, which is all about the various days and times appointed by God to have complete concentration on the Lord. And he calls these holy convocations. That's not really a word we use very often today. It comes from the Hebrew word mikra, and it means a holy summons or holy assembly. And and later on in the history of Israel, these holy summons would actually include reading and recitation from the word of God. That Hebrew word mikra is actually based on the word call from Hebrew, which is kara. And in Nehemiah 8.8, we see an example of the recitation reading of Scripture in front of the entire assembly of Israel at one of these holy summons, one of these feast days, festivals. And so that's what these are, Sabbaths and feast days that we see in chapter 23. Verse 3 is on the Sabbaths. And uh, we've spoken about this before when it comes to the Sabbath day of whether that applies to the church or not. Uh, I do want to point out something that Alan Ross in his commentary, Holiness to the Lord, said on pages 398 and 399. He says that the Sabbath was never imposed on any people other than Israel. Uh, He goes on to speak about how the Sabbath, of course, is representative, not that God needed to rest, but rather that he had completed his work, and therefore there didn't need to be a seventh day. He chose six in order to complete all his work. He could have done it in one day if he wanted to, but this was to set things up for man to be able, especially Israel, to be able to have those work days and a day of rest. And the Sabbath day was applied to Israel alone under the Mosaic Covenant. Uh, Ross goes on to say, Sabbath was then a commemoration of God's work of redemption, which was not completed until all the promises were fulfilled in the land of promise. And so the Sabbath is tied in Deuteronomy to that redemption of God's people out of Egypt. And notice that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob did not have a Sabbath to keep. The Sabbath did not come until this Mosaic covenant. Um, Verses 4 through 8 of chapter 23, we see the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, of course, representing that great redemption from Egypt. Um, In chapter 23, verses 9 through 14, we see the Feast of First fruits, say that five times fast, uh, once they took the land of Canaan, they would go through the Feast of First Fruits, um, and, and this would happen as soon as there was grain to be harvested. Your first batch of harvest, a little bit of grain, you would stop, and, and you would have this feast at that appointed time. In chapter 23, verses 15 through 22, we see the Feast of Weeks, which came at the completion of the grain harvests and recognized what God had provided during the harvest so far. And then the harvest time ends with verses 23 through 25, the Feast of Trumpets. And that was the end of the harvest season, also referred to as the Great Ingathering. And this would be the beginning of the new year for Israel, where the people would anticipate Look forward to spiritual renewal and thanksgiving to the Lord. And that spiritual renewal, of course, came about through the Day of Atonement, as we see in verses 26 through 32 of chapter 23. The people would have their iniquities removed, the guilt removed from them uh, through that atonement. Remember, this is when the high priest enters the Holy of Holies, that one day of year that he could do so. And they would begin the new year with a clean slate, so to speak. And uh, this would be the most holy day of the year for the nation of Israel. And then finally, in chapter 23, we end with the Feast of Booths in verses 33 through 44. Booths or tabernacles. Uh, this would be five days after the Day of Atonement. And this would also mark the ingathering of any fruits and summer crops that the people of Israel got together. Well, in chapter 24, verses 1 through 9, we get instructions regarding the lampstand and the bread of the sanctuary, which had to be provided for each and every day of the year. And these were two things that could have been easily overlooked if they were not reminded to the people. And the people of Israel had to set aside olives and grain throughout the year from their harvests so that they'd be able to provide the olive oil for the lampstand and the bread for the showbread that went on the table inside the tabernacle. And they had to do this. Make sure that that lampstand was burning all day long, every day, and that that bread was on that table every day as well. Chapter 24, verses 10 through 23, the rest of the chapter, uh, we see that the name of God, Yahweh, is so precious 
so holy, because he is holy, theme of Leviticus, that to blaspheme his name and curse was to actually bring a curse upon the person who did so. It was a violation of the third commandment, and it led to that man's death. And we see that example by the end of the chapter. Now in verses 17 through 22, kind of a familiar section for a lot of us, one of those rare familiar sections from the book of Leviticus, uh, the expression of biblical justice. The punishment must fit the crime. In Latin, it's known as the lex talionis, or the law of retaliation. Now, the commentators, Alan Ross as well as Wenham, uh, they argue that this lex talionis could not be literally applied because, for example, if you caused blindness in your neighbor, and then you, if to take this completely literally in its application, would then have blindness caused to you, you could actually die in that process. Whatever that process would have been to cause blindness in you, you could have died, and therefore you'd have an upsetting of that uh, punishment fits the crime. The punishment would not fit the crime at all. Death is not the right punishment for someone losing their sight. And so they make the argument that uh, while we understand it literally, of course, literal grammatical historical hermeneutic, just as Jesus and the prophets and the apostles all used in Scripture to understand any Scripture that came before, we understand that the application, however, is referring, uh, according to Ross and Wenham, and and I think that they are on to the right track here, uh, the lex talionis is referring to monetary compensation that fit the crime in question, unless, of course, that crime required a capital punishment, such as blaspheming the Lord, as we see in this passage, or committing premeditated murder, as we see in Genesis 9, 5, and 6. So some principles from these two chapters of Leviticus. Well, God is great and greatly to be praised, is he not? He must be worshipped. And that's why he had all of those feast days and Sabbaths to cause the people to stop in their labors and to worship him, to provide the sacrifices, the offerings. Notice how many extra offerings there were too. There was no just 10% tithing going on at all in the Old Testament. It was constant more giving to the Lord, giving to the Lord, complete reliance on him. And God's people need to stop their labors from time to time to concentrate especially on honoring and glorifying the Lord. And yet, those who belong to the Lord also ought to live their entire lives every day as an act of worship unto Him. We see this in Romans 12, being a living sacrifice to the Lord. Uh, Unger says, nowhere is the Sabbath keeping ever imposed upon a Christian in this age of grace. Instead, the or indeed, the very opposite is true. And that fits exactly what Jesus said in John 4, 23 to 24, when he spoke to the Samaritan woman at the well. He said, an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father. How? In spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and and truth. Truth according to the word of God in spirit, that is at all times. And because God is worthy of such worship, another principle we see, God's people must never tolerate blasphemy. To speak ill of the Lord or to use his name in vain, whether it's Lord or God or Jesus or Christ, anything that's going to be using the Lord's name in vain and and any kind of blaming God for evil, that's all blasphemy, terrible sin that we should avoid and should not celebrate. And really, we must refrain from watching and engaging in any kind of media where where the blasphemy of God's name is is put on display, as well as any other sins that are just kind of lifted up and glorified uh, before mankind. We need to be completely separate, holy, away from all of that sinful garbage Uh, Such were we as Christians, right? We were those same wretched sinners who only thought and acted that way, but we're not any longer. We need to be removed from it. And some further application, let's remember, as as we kind of think any time Passover, as we think uh, the the redemption, the, the showbread, as we think the unleavened bread, as we think all of these sacrifices and everything that's going on, it should always cause us to think of the greater Passover, Right, The Lord's Supper, that, that final Passover meal that Christ took with his disciples, and the far greater redemption of God's people that he instituted with the new covenant, namely the saving of the elect from the domain of darkness, as Colossians 1, 13 and 14 puts it. And that was accomplished by Jesus Christ on the cross. Is your faith in Christ alone? If so, do you worship the Lord in spirit and truth, or do you just wait 
until certain appointed times, such as Sunday, or maybe Sunday and Wednesday, to worship and glorify him? Is it only your devotional time in the morning, but the rest of the day is just kind of for you? And if you are a Christian, do you relish this eye-for-an-eye instruction and seek vengeance on those who harm you? I would caution you, take great care. Because remember what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 38 and 40 through 42. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, and he's not contradicting scripture here, right? He, he came to fulfill the law, not to abolish it. What he's saying is, is that their application of this by this time had been all about seeking personal vengeance. And so that's why he says, but I say to you, do not resist an evil person. Whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. And while civil authority must operate on a punishment fits the crime principle in order to be just, individually, we must reject personal vengeance and be willing to be like Jesus and treated unjustly. After all, if you're a Christian, then that means that Christ went to the cross for you and I, though he had done nothing wrong. I hope this all gives us plenty to think about as we finish on Leviticus chapters 23 and 24. Hope you have a great day.